Afternoon, Lindsay. This is Travis from Horror Movies Uncut and the Submissions and Slashers podcast. And I'm very, very thrilled to be talking to you, Miss Lindsay Anderson Beer, about the film Pet Cemetery Bloodlines. First and foremost, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm great. I'm so excited. The movie's coming out. Excited to talk to you. Thanks for taking the time. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. It's been a difficult task, of course, because of all the madness that's been going on with Fantastic Fest. There's so many great movies. But of course, we're talking about Pet Cemetery Bloodlines, which is an adaption from one of the most popular chapters in Stephen King's original tale of Pet Cemetery. So the first thing I want to know from you, Lindsay, is do you have a background involving Stephen King? Did someone introduce the books to you? Uh, was Pet Cemetery possibly your favorite growing up? Or did you have another one like Carrie or Cujo that it might have possibly been your favorite Pet Cemetery book and adaption? Cemetery was my favorite book. I read it. Okay. Accident. I found it in a library. I was about nine or 10. I saw it on the shelf and I read it in a night. I was definitely too young to read it, but I loved it anyway. <laughs> And it it just ignited this Stephen King and horror fandom in me. And so being able to tell a chapter in that tale has just been really a, a childhood dream come true for sure. That's awesome. What is so important about the story with Timmy Baderman that this needed to happen? Like, how is it that we are not able to leave the Pet Cemetery franchise without the story of Timmy Baderman? Well, there is so much in the book that is not has not been told in movies. And, and most importantly, as it relates to Timmy, the book says that Timmy and Judd's encounter with Timmy and, you know, helping fight the, the evil that, that uh, possesses Timmy is why the evil is targeting Judd as an older man. Okay. And the book also says is at the end, it calls Judd the guardian of the woods, which mm -hmm. he that's kind of a secret mantle that we don't know about. Like when we see Judd as an older man in the movies, he's like drinking and smoking on the porch. He's kind of mysterious. Yeah. It just feels like there's this whole backstory to Judd that we don't know about. And that there's a mystery to the town and to Judd that hasn't been told. That's kind of hinted at, at the book in the book that I wanted to expand upon. And I had so many questions as a fan of Pet Cemetery that I wanted to be able to answer in this. And then I just, you know, for me as a, as a storyteller and a lover of Pet Cemetery, like everything is obviously a product of its time. And I felt like, you know, there's the trope of the mystical indigenous and the cursed land that I felt like really needed an update. And so mm -hmm. it was to me to change the mythology and update it and say, okay, the Wendigo, the cursed land, everything you think you know about the, the, the evil in Pet Cemetery not true either a yeah. <laughs> superstition or a downright cover-up or whatever it is that here here's the true story and to be able to create some point of view characters who are indigenous to help tell that that story was also important to me what type of research is involved in that if you don't mind me asking when you're looking to make sure because i feel like that's something that is very important in filmmaking is when you are using what's known as sacred lands and things like that, that you're giving the respect to the people from these areas. What type of research was involved in that process? A lot of research, a lot of research about um, kind of colonialism at the time, a lot of research about uh, indigenous beliefs, a lot of research about even pagan beliefs, because the, you know, the symbol from the, sp the spiral from the book, that's, that's not a, a Micmac symbol, that's a, a pagan symbol. And so I started thinking about, okay, who were the visitors here? Who was influencing kind of belief systems at the time? So um, I also consulted with several indigenous groups um, in that's great. screenplay. And uh, and then the actors themselves, Forrest Goodluck and Isabella Star LeBlanc, had a lot of input into their characters as well. That's amazing. I love hearing that because I think, you know, the, the one thing that I wanted to touch base on next was this young cast, because one of the things about the film that I think really stuck out and in my review, I just keep talking about how it feels like such a true Stephen King adaptation movie when I watched it, the way that the whole entire movie laid out. This combination of the young cast and these veterans icons, if you may, yeah. of genre films like David Duchovny, Pam Greer, and the like, and uh, and Henry Thomas, 
How was that interaction between the young cast and this this group of these amazing actors? Were there uh, were they able to work off of each other and really use each other during these dramatic scenes? Tell me a little bit about how that was going on on the scenes. Absolutely, I felt like they really inspired each other and brought the best out of each other, and it was fun. Even you know, just uh, you know, in an intense scene, getting them to get even closer to each other and bringing the camera in more, and they'd tease each other about you know, let, 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 let bring it even harder in the next take, and. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> there, there was a lot of good natured ribbing and mentorship. And I, I feel like the whole cast got along so well. It is Isabella um, who plays Donna. She would host like art parties because her character is an artist. And so she was like, yes. on the side. And oh, so okay. Come over and do art parties. They learned how to make sourdough and bagels. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank the pandemic for all the bread machines still out there, right? <laughs> so... Whenever you got a guy like David Duchovny and and he's like jumping into a role like this and being so vital for what's going on in the entire story, like how much do you allow someone like him to just kind of really be his own character and bring in what he wants to to the character? Or is it more like, hey, I want this to be this way and he's just receptive to it and you're able to work? How is that relationship? It, it's it's both, you know. I, he brings so much authenticity and thought to to every like just to every scene he's in. He really responded to the script and to because he is a father and and he really responded to the character and. Me too. Had, Me too. He had a lot of thoughts about you know what his character would be doing in any given scene, and to me that's one of the most rewarding parts of filmmaking as a filmmaker is you know, you hire these incredibly talented actors and then the the role takes on a like an even more kind of dynamic uh, quality to it, right? It's such a collaboration. Mm-hmm. I very much encourage all of my actors to bring their own thing to stuff. That's That's what makes things magical and come to life. For sure. That's beautiful. I love hearing that. Okay. I only have a few more for you, Lindsay. I could talk to you about this movie forever. I'm going to be honest with you. When it comes out, my mama's going to want to talk to you about this movie because <laughs> Pet Cemetery. that was her book when I was growing up. So it's going to be, I can't, I've been telling her about the film the entire time. So she's going to be looking forward to it tremendously. I love that. One of the things about me though, is I am a car guy okay. and there is a beautiful Beaumont in this yeah. movie. Yeah. Uh, the music also, just the entire setting, it really, really took me back to my childhood watching adaptations of Stephen King movies because cars and music and all those were so big, important things in those films. Was that something of your own inkling of, hey, we need to make sure stuff like this is in the movie as well, or is this something that was brought to you? No, for sure. I, and and the like the cars and the music were some of the, the most fun things to pick. You know, it, it was um, those cars are so beautiful from the era. And I just felt yes. like I was in the store picking, picking the cars. And, and they're also, you know, a joy to film, too. I love the driving scenes. Um, but the music is music that my mom introduced me to when I was a kid and music that meant something to me when I was a kid. And so I was just so happy to be able to put it in the film. That's awesome. Last question. Thank you so much for your time, Lindsay. I really, really am looking forward to everyone seeing this because I know how many Pet Cemetery fans are out there. Tell me, last but not least, how has Paramount helped you? get this film out there and, and, and back you on everything Pet Cemetery Bloodlines related and what's something you hope that people really, really take, especially the true Pet Cemetery fans from seeing this film when it's over? Yeah, I mean, Paramount has been an amazing partner. They really have been and so supportive of the film and, and getting it out there. And I just, I hope Pet Cemetery fans see this and, and think, oh my God, this, this is the prequel that maybe I didn't know that I needed, but now I've learned, you know, I've learned so much and it deepens the lore and the, and the history and understanding of these characters we love. And I, you know, I just hope people love it. Awesome. It is the prequel we all needed. So thank you so much for making it for us, Lindsay. Best of luck with the film. I can't wait for everyone to see it. And I can't wait to see what's next on your list because our eyes will be on you this entire time now. Okay. Have a lovely rest of your day and thanks so much for your time. Bye. Take care.